Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Here we are with Susan making the playing the air guitar before we even get on the on the stream today. Thank you all for joining us. We have a lot of fun this week. Today is no exception. We're gonna get some really interesting conversation going. Uh, Susan and I are back from Austin. Are we in one piece? Just barely. You can um, you can see uh, Doctor Drew after dark right now if you wish. Susan is up there as my guest. A previous episode uh, six weeks ago, five weeks ago. <laughs> we, we we recorded it five weeks ago, but you, she was just sitting behind the mic here laughing about it. So yeah, I, I it guess it's a good, good episode. That was actually and fun. Uh, she and I went on an adventure in Austin and talked about it in an upcoming episode. You, you have to wait about a month to see that one, I think. I know. But uh, but you all know. recovered. Yeah, I'm fine. If you unrestream, uh, let's see. Why don't you guys on Restream uh, guess for me where we went and what we did with the Booth Boys? Uh, right. Something... Don't don't make a spoiler alert. Uh, I'll just see what they come up with. See how attuned in they are to us there. I don't see anybody on the Restream. I don't know uh, mine's going loud and clear. Oh, you must be in the wrong yeah, spot. Yeah, something's wrong. I must not have Wi-Fi. Yep. So, uh, uh, well, someone got it already. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so, and it was an adventure. Um, this week, we have a lot coming up on Thursday. General Anthony Tata coming in here. He's written a new book. We have Jeremy Murphy coming back on Wednesday. And uh, on Tuesday, we have Dr. Roger Nelson. I forget why I told them Michelle to book Dr. Nelson, but I do not forget why I uh, asked her to book our present guest, Dr. Aaron Cari Cariotti. Uh, Dr. Cariotti was fired for not complying with his COVID-19 mandate. Uh, and he has taken up uh, arms since then, essentially, and he's been contending that natural immunity from his 2020 infection should have been um, sufficient, if not superior, to vaccination. Uh, so here we are. He's currently the chief of psychiatry and ethics at Doc One Health, also chief of medical ethics at the Unity Project. Dr. Cariotti, welcome to the program. And there you are. Oh, Oop, no we sound. don't hear you now. We lost your lost your sound. Is that on our end or on yours? Yeah, we were so good there during the the preamble. Oh, up. No, this. he's there. All right. I, we couldn't hear him. There he is. Now like you're your now you're shirt, back. By the way, it's beautiful. Can you hear me? Now you're back. Beautiful color. Oh, thank you. I do hear you now. You I think me? you tapped. Okay. Your, you must have tapped your earpiece as I'm prone you to do, and turns good, it all off. You look good. <laughs> all right. All right, there you are. Okay, give him his intro again. And uh, and, <laughs> and Caleb, can you turn up the volume a little bit on Dr. Cariotti? A little bit. I think so let's be do good the here. intro again so Caleb can cut this part out of the podcast. All right. Dr. Aaron Cariotti is currently Chief of Psychiatry and Ethics at Doc One Health, also Chief of Medical Ethics at the Unity Project, a Fellow and Director of the Program in Bioethics and American Democracy at the Ethics and Public Policies Center. Dr. Cariotti, welcome to the program. Great. It's great to be here, Drew. Thank you. So uh, this did this all start with your employment problems? Is that where you uh, sort of... Um, sort of, I don't mean to say it this way, but many of us have been urged to sort of get off the couch and stand up and do something. Is, is that where that started for you? Yeah. Well, in a sense, my more public facing work did start back in August when I filed a lawsuit in federal court challenging the University of California's vaccine mandate on behalf of people like me who had natural immunity or infection induced immunity to COVID. Mm -hmm. And my employment problems that you alluded to started shortly after that. I was initially placed on uh, suspension. Uh, I was placed on leave, then on unpaid suspension about a month later. And a month after that, I was dismissed for alleged noncompliance with the vaccine mandate after the university twice rejected my medical exemption request. But actually, even prior to filing that lawsuit in federal court, about a month before that, I had published a piece in the Wall Street Journal advocating and arguing that university vaccine mandates, like the one that was being considered at the University of California where I worked, that these were unethical, that these violated basic principles 
of medical ethics. So by the time the university finalized its vaccine mandate policy, I had already publicly argued and, you know, in a very uh, sort of public venue that this mandate was problematic. And, you know, my, my position there at the university was uh, precisely the director of the medical ethics program at the hospital. So this was within my area of supposed expertise that the university had recognized. Um, But certainly my my views and my advocacy um, work in terms of uh, arguing against some of these unjust vaccine mandates started getting a lot more attention after the university took that disciplinary disciplinary action against me, because I, I guess it it grabs headlines when you see that the university's director of medical ethics was fired after challenging the ethics of one of their, one of their policies. Right. And if I know my, uh, my, uh, my, I don't want to even say peers, if I know my media outlets well enough, the headlines were medical ethicist fired for medical ethics violation. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly how it, how it all read. And so, and, and so uh, did, did when you first, took in a position, had an opinion. Well, let me ask it differently. Do you think the fact that people were already aware of your position was causing whomever were making these decisions to decide against you? You already were a troublemaker, so that, to speak. Yeah. I, it, look, it wouldn't surprise me uh, if the, the higher ups were bothered by that Wall Street Journal piece. Uh, you know, directly, in fact, in, in one point in the piece, mentioning the University of California as one example of the universities that were considering or planning to implement such policies. So I'm sure that did not win me a lot of friends um, among the administration. Mm-hmm. But um, at, at that point, at least, no one had said anything to me or attempted to discipline me in any way that would have, in, in a very egregious and obvious way, violated the university's academic freedom policy. So they da- they actually didn't take that step of dismissing me until after I filed the lawsuit in, in federal court. And even then they, they, they claimed, I think rather implausibly given just the timing of how everything played out, they claimed that my dismissal had nothing to do with the fact that I was challenging the vaccine mandate in federal court, but, but was only and exclusively due to my you know alleged non-compliance with the with the policy mm. well it sort of doesn't matter i suppose so let let's talk about the the ethics of this what what i i, yeah. I spoke to art kaplan about this and as the pandemic has gone on he has uh equivocated a bit in his position at first he was very favor of mandates as and, and the arguments yeah. in favor of mandates i think people are pretty aware of it's essentially you know I, I don't know that it's, on one hand it's not ethics, on one hand it's we've given constitutional authority to these public health officials so-called to do whatever they need to do in an emergency, which is, you can argue whether that at its foundation is an ethical position, which is, I suppose, one position. And the other is uh, we've taken the position, or th- many have taken the position, that uh, you have an obligation to the whole. Uh, and although there's a certain amount of risk, uh, that risk is uh, well-defined, so called, <laughs> and then, and then, uh, even if it's not going to, uh, the the part that I got uh, Art Kaplan to equivocate on was, really, is there benefit to the individual? Can you really ask somebody to do something only on the basis of the whole? If there's no clear benefit and only potential harm, that's where he started waffling a little bit. What what is your position? Yeah, yeah. So I think both of those are very serious issues. Both those issues that you raised. One is the circumstances under which this is done and the invocation of emergency powers when, you know, what qualifies as a public health emergency was never defined in laws. So you notice that this declared state of emergency has continued at the federal level. It was just renewed indefinitely again on March 1st. And in in many states, Mm -hmm. they continue to have this declared state Mm -hmm. of emergency. But nowhere has any public authority said you know, it's this number of cases or this number or percentage of hospital beds that need to be filled or a death count that's in this range. That's what qualifies as a public health emergency. So it's this open-ended sort of um, power grab in a sense. And without any clearly defined threshold for what counts as an emergency, 
the public also has no way of of holding in check uh, that that shift of power uh, toward more sort of authoritarian measures because we don't have any way of defining when the emergency is over. And I think that's probably right. in part by by design. If you leave it open ended like that, then when it comes time to relinquish those powers, you can you can continue to argue that it's still necessary. But the other the other issue right. you mentioned, Drew, is also very important. And that's if you look at what these vaccines, the, specifically the COVID vaccines, can and cannot accomplish, you see that the the kind of common good argument of, you know, even if you're young and healthy and you're not really at risk of bad outcomes from COVID, you should still get vaccinated for the sake of protecting other people. That's kind of the, mm -hmm. I, I would say, the strongest argument in favor of vaccine mandates. And I think it would remain, you know, a, 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 an important argument if we were dealing with a vaccine that actually offered sterilizing immunity, that actually not only prevented me from getting uh, severely ill with the virus, but also prevented me from getting even a lower level infection that I can transmit. Why? Let me ask. Let's, let me drill on that a little bit. Why? Why does that? Yeah. Why does that really matter? Because the, the ethical principle. I don't know. Why is the ethical principle a shift there? Well, uh, so w when we're dealing with a vaccine that can only potentially benefit or potentially harm the recipient then we have to fall back on sort of traditional bedside medical ethics, which is the ethics of informed consent. And that's precisely what was thrown out the window when it came to these vaccine mm -hmm. mandates. Mm -hmm. um, now, okay, I'm not well, saying let's that wait, I hang endorse... on, there's a lot in, hang, hang on, because there's, there's a lot, I'm, I'm sorry, we have a little time delay, so it f seems like I'm talking on top of you, but 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 I, I do want to drill on these things and make sure I don't forget them before. Um, the, the informed consent, right? I feel like the, the if I learn one thing from this pandemic, well, not about one thing, but one of the central themes I saw evolving was that individual practitioners and individual patients were removed from <laughs> from every decision. It was all centralized yes. authority. It was all centralized yes. bureaucratic decision making that that couldn't adjust course, that couldn't discuss science, yes. that couldn't. Consider what a give a, a, the actual practitioner the only the only it's it's wolves in the hen coop except for the practitioner he's the he or she's the one person that has to protect the patient none of that mattered and so there was informed consent was out the whole way right it never really was in the yeah. equation with any of the things we did with COVID yeah yeah no that's exactly right and ordinarily physicians are given pretty wide. Uh, discretion, pretty wide latitude to make judgments that are tailored to this particular patient, right? A specialist, as you, as you and your audience, I'm sure, knows very well, a specialist in a particular disease, especially if it's a rare disease, knows that patient and knows that disease better than any public health bureaucrat. And if in their judgment, you know, this, the, the risk-benefit ratio for, let's say, a vaccine differs for this particular patient, they should be able to exercise uh, their their clinical judgment and make a recommendation to that patient that may be different than what they recommend to other patients. But that that kind of individualized, tailored treatment is precisely what got steamrolled during the pandemic with so many of our policies. I think the most egregious example of that were the vaccine mandates. But there were actually many other examples of that as well, where a kind of all or nothing, one size fits all policy, a, a needle in every arm, um, didn't take account of some very basic epidemiological facts about different populations, didn't take into account, for example, that the risks of morbidity and mortality to a healthy child or adolescent are a thousandfold less, orders of magnitude less than the risks of bad outcomes from COVID to, let's say, an 85-year-old. And yet the, the eight-year-old and the 85-year-old in our vaccine mandate policies, in many cases, were treated as though they were equivalent. And that's just, that's bad medicine, that's bad public health. And the, the bulwark against those kinds of abuses has been since the time of the Nuremberg Code in 1947, that was articulated after the, the, the atrocities of Nazi medicine during World War II, the central principle of that code and subsequent 
uh, medical codes that are based upon uh, that principle is the principle of, of free and informed consent, the ability to accept or refuse a proposed medical intervention yeah. for myself yeah. or on behalf yeah. of my children if they're too young to consent. Yeah. So I'm looking at the uh, the data you're referencing on the uh, hospitalization of death in the 0 to 17 age group versus the 85 plus. It's 8,700 times greater in the 85 plus. If you're in the 75 plus, 75 to 84, it's 3,200 times greater. And yet, again, another, and I don't understand why we're not spinning and talking and trying to figure out what went wrong. Another piece of the public health uh, misadventure, I'm going to use kind words as much as I can, uh, was the complete unwillingness to look at the age distribution of this illness. That's and right. still doing bizarre things like masking two-year-olds. I mean, b truly bizarre things that's done nowhere else on earth. Just really wild stuff. What, what do you imagine? I, I, some of it to me is that we didn't have clinicians. Well, I've got so many different questions. I, I mean, one of it was we didn't have clinicians in the driver's seat. We, we really didn't. We had either bureaucrats or non-physicians. Right. Or frankly, and I've recently seen this a little bit too, and this is not to disparage my pediatric peers, but I don't think pediatric training is right for massive adult infectious disease decisions. I don't, I've noticed they're, they're just, they're very, I, I talked to, for instance, um, Hotez, good guy, smart guy, knows what he's talking about, good on vaccines. His perception of the neurological, adult neurological risks of COVID was so distorted. And I didn't, I walked away yeah. kind of thinking about things he was saying. And I went, oh, he doesn't, he's never seen adult neurology. He doesn't understand how that works. And that's informing his level of anxiety around uh, COVID risks. And I thought, oh my God, we have literally the wrong people making the decisions or you're in los angeles you have a sociologist not even a clinician at all making these decisions that are massively complex risk reward diathesis and with zero experience doing that for adult infectious disease that that really bugs me i don't know about you yeah i know i totally agree i think that's exactly right um we had a kind of public health tunnel vision a kind of myopia that started very early on in the pandemic, where we were only looking at COVID case counts, COVID case curves, and in a kind of uh, fear-induced or panic-induced scramble to have um, policies that appeared to be you know, doing more to solve this crisis. I think there was this kind of competition that public health authorities and governmental authorities had with one another to you know, bring my state or my county down to the lowest possible COVID case numbers, while simultaneously ignoring the collateral damage and the collateral harm, including public health harms, um, that that many of these all or nothing policies were causing, from the initial widespread lockdowns that remain uh, prolonged to uh, to the vaccine mandates that didn't stratify recipients by risk. Um, there, there seemed to be a lack of both adequate depth and adequate breadth uh, among the people that were making these decisions. And sad to say, there were just too many physicians who, instead of carefully and with an appropriate degree of skepticism, kind of scrutinizing the medical literature and keeping up with the scientific papers, were instead getting their information about COVID from you know, cable news or from network news, which is designed to get clicks and designed to get viewers. And, and we know now often deployed kind of scary headlines or fears to generate viewer interest. And, and, and I, I think that just created a social climate where lots of people just were not thinking critically and were not looking at the big picture. And so Why did that up, happen? For example, why did that happen? And that we're trained to do that. What happened? And let me let me let me prime the witness a little bit by saying that uh, I had this. You know, I was living it in real time. <laughs> this whole thing. I will not soon yeah. forget it. But one of the first things I noticed was all of my surgical colleagues. And I got a lot of surgical friends. 
were calling me on the DL going, I'm trying this, I'm trying that. What are you seeing? What do you tried? They were out there improvising because yep. they aren't put upon the way those of us in the, the cognitive sciences are. They're in a surgical field. No one tells them what to do. They improvise. They do what they got to do. They do what they're trained to do, and they just get it done. And so when it comes into other decision-making, they have a similar attitude. You and I are – we have people up our – hook eye all the time, whether it's administrators or insurance companies, or you have so many clinical pathways, whatever it is, I, I worry that our cognitive peers have sort of given up the, the autonomy. They've given up their ability to decision make and to, yeah. and to do what they know is right or to improvise the best possible for their judgment, best possible care of the patient in front of them. Like they don't do, do they do that anymore? I, I haven't trained residents in a while. Have they lost that capacity and they just freeze and wait for direction from above? Well, there, there is a kind of, I think there has been a kind of shift in medical education, which I was deeply involved in for 15 years at the university before I was dismissed. And uh, the trend seems to be in the direction of more uh, algorithmic, uh, you know, best practice kind of follow the the recipe or the cookbook mentality among medical students so the, the innovators the ones you know the ones who who mm -hmm. think critically um who examine the research critically I, I think they tend to get weeded out of the system that rewards it's a system that quite frankly rewards conformity and rewards a, a kind of group think about the right approach to things. That's terrible you news. You combine that. That is terrible news. That's how you get the opiate crisis. That's how the opiate crisis yeah, happened. Right. I, I was there fighting against it. That's I exactly was right. railing against yep. it for a decade. That's how you get that. That's how you get, people are so outraged by the uh, the um, physical rehab doctors that were you know doing internal releases on these. That probably came from the same kind of source of, hey, the superior told me that's how you release the psoas muscles, so that's what I do yeah. without contemplating the effect on the patient. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you can get to terrible places. That's how you get to the, you get to terrible places if you're just following directions from above. You go to terrible places as a physician, as opposed to standing back and thinking critically about every decision you make. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll I let think you we can't, we also <laughs> uh, we also can't ignore the uh, the economic realities that were at work and that shaped the the response of healthcare institutions during the pandemic. So you have hospital CEOs who very often are not physicians, right? They're looking at the financial bottom line. Often, and then you have yep. C CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services incentivizing uh, certain metrics with higher payments, right? So you get if you get paid more for a COVID patient, then you're going to be incentivized to test with PCR tests at very high cycle thresholds that may generate a lot of yep. false positives and count false as a COVID positive. case, mm -hmm. uh, someone who is just has a positive COVID test, but zero symptoms. So I recall consulting on patients um, on our medicine ward who were isolated for COVID had zero COVID symptoms and they were there because they were suicidal, right? They were there for mm -hmm. psychiatric mm -hmm. reasons and yet they would have been included in, uh, you know, hospitalized with COVID type metrics. And so I think those, those perverse financial incentives also uh, led to hospital administrators leaning on physicians to, um, to practice medicine in a particular way because that would increase the mm -hmm. bottom line for for the institution and when those financial conflicts of interest are at work it's it becomes harder to to you know step out of line raise your hand and ask critical questions about what are we doing here and why are why are we doing things this way and does this really make sense but to your you know i mean i it's axiomatic to me but we're still not just us having this conversation is considered misinformation and anti-vax. And I, you know, I've been on the record. I, I get it from both sides, right? Because I am, you know, I, yeah. I was telling my 85 year old patients a month ago, prepare for a fourth shot. Pre I, I'm, I'm going to get you another yeah. booster. I know it's coming. And now Pfizer's on the record saying it is. And by the same token, 
I have parents calling me, friends asking about their eight-year-olds, and I'm like, I, I, <laughs> that's a tough decision. You need to make that decision with your pediatrician. That's not anti-vax. Yeah. That's using medical technologies the way they're designed to be used. And by the same token, oh, well, this is a different issue. We'll talk about therapeutics next, but go ahead. What, what do you say? What's yeah, your so, actual vaccine I mean, position? Yeah. I, well, I'm totally with you. I mean, I was... I was very eager for a safe and effective vaccine. I helped the university design their vaccine allocation policy, not the vaccine mandate, but the policy about who should who should be in line first, the university for the vaccine. I was on the Orange County Vaccine Task Force. So I was very eager for a safe and effective vaccine that would be a powerful tool in this pandemic. But what I saw with the empirical realities of this vaccine was a vaccine whose efficacy declined very quickly um, and the booster efficacy seems to decline even more quickly than the initial doses, a vaccine that didn't stop infection sure. and transmission, and, and a vaccine that has, I think, um, unexamined potential safety issues that are being ignored yeah. or suppressed, whose, yeah. whose clinical trial was shortened very significantly because of the uh, sort of emergent needs of the pandemic. And so what, when when people ask me, Dr. Cariotti, are you, are you anti-vax or pro-vax? I, I say that question makes about as much sense to me as, hey, Dr. Cariotti, are you pro-medication or anti-medication? Right. The answer right. is obviously, you know, right. which medication for which patient or which patient population under what yep. circumstances? It's just yep. a nonsensical question. And I think, I think the anti-vax slur is just meant to shut down conversation. Anyone who raises any qu critical questions about a vaccine gets labeled with this um, this tag that is kind of really meant to exclude you from ra you know rational conversation and and just dismiss any concerns that you might have and and that i mean to me that kind of name calling is really inimical to critical thinking and um, and a sort of a appropriately nuanced and critical approach to any new intervention whether it be a novel medication or or a novel vaccine. What was your undergraduate training? Uh, so I studied philosophy and pre-medical sciences at Notre Dame as an undergraduate. So you had both philosophy and, and a science degree, right? Yeah, and that's where my interest in yeah. medical ethics started actually very early as an undergraduate. I continued to pursue that during medical school and residency in my, my early career. So I've always had this kind of dual interest in um, both the humanities and and in the medical sciences. And your your training was psychiatry, correct? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I'm board certified in in adult psychiatry. Did my residency at UC Irvine. So if you include my residency, mm -hmm. I was there for for 19 years. Really, my whole career was spent up until a couple of months ago at at the university. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I was at the hospital that I trained at both as a medical student and as a resident and uh, worked there for many years for 35 years. And uh, when it came time to get a vaccine, in spite of the fact of me treating, I was treating COVID patients regularly, I wasn't, I wasn't part of the uh, structure they put in place to be vaccinated. It was unbelievable. They're, you know, I guess each hospital had their own vaccine policies. This hospital was wild. And I, con I actually contracted COVID running around the hospital trying to convince the medical staff that I would like to volunteer in the ER, <laughs> I would happily work in the tent, <laughs> and I'm seeing COVID patients, yeah. please give me this vaccine. And uh, five days, four days later, I was sick. So three days later, really, I guess it was. Oh, oh the and, irony. Uh, yeah, so, we can add that to the list I know, of, of I know. Uh, bad policies I during the pandemic. I, I know, I know, I know. Again, centralized, bureaucratic, rigid, yeah. unwilling to look at itself. And that's, that's when things go bad. That's when things go bad. So, um, you know, my natural immunity has a really interesting um, sort of course to it. I uh, have been following it with this thing called an Attitick score, which is they've just applied for emergency youth auth use authorization. It's, it's a really yeah. comprehensive immune profile, nuclear capsid, couple of spike proteins, neutralizing antibodies, IgA, IgG, IG, yeah. IgM. And so I've been watching this the whole time. And um, yeah. when I got alpha, my stuff was way, <laughs> way up. Where I, sort of during my alpha, they drew my blood. It was like, it was insane. But it quickly decayed, but I remained moderately elevated, like moderately 
uh, immune. But we were going to go to Europe, and without you know to go to Europe, you have to have a you know a code, a QR code. So you got to get some yep. kind of vaccine. And I thought, man, J and J, you know, what the hell? I'm sort of looking. For, I was looking at these sort of protein and and viral platforms and things that I was more used to with vaccines. And I thought, I don't want to take two shots. I'll just take one. Took the sure. J and J vaccine. Had a horrible reaction to it. Had a spontaneous yep. raccoon's eyes, which, by the way, is the presenting feature of transverse sinus thrombosis, which uh, yep. was fascinating to sit there looking in the mirror going, Jesus, am I going to be the only male with this complication? Uh, it went away for whatever reason. I, there was some sort of platelet activation or something, which is what happens with the spike protein, we know. And uh, then I kept following my immunity and it was up, 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 up. And it started to decay after about uh, about eight months. And I started thinking, you know, maybe I should get another booster. Which one would I get? Novavax, Covaxin, I'd like that. Novavax should be out soon. I, I was sitting here ruminating about it, and I thought, best thing would be if I got Omicron. That would really give me good yep. immunity. Next day, sick with Omicron. And so, <laughs> and so uh, I, didn't add, I didn't go get it. It just it came to me. Now I was had, in denial and gave it to the rest of us. The rest of the family got it. Thanks. <laughs> to uh, well, thanks to Jordan. Jordan brought it in to be fair as, as at most 90% of COVID it transmits in the home where we are being isolated. So, okay, good job, yeah. everybody. So, um, everyone got Omicron. It was mild, mild, mild. One son had a pretty nasty, nasty version. He had, he had not had booster. He'd only had the first vaccine series over a year ago. And um, for me, it was, I couldn't even believe it was Omicron compared to Alpha. It was like, it was a nothing. Um, but I just had my, this is a long story to tell you, I just had my antibody screened. And I've had as exuberant a response to Omicron as I had to the Alpha. And it made right. me think, I wonder if that's the reason we're seeing this massive drop off in cases that we're really getting some very robust immunity from Omicron. And one of the original sort of headlines was Omicron won't keep you safe. It won't be as robust as Alpha. I'm starting to think it is. What do you think? Yeah. No, I agree. That's my my reading of what we've seen uh, with Omicron and the immune markers from Omicron. There, there doesn't seem to be the strong correlation that a lot of people assumed between severity of infection and kind of the quality, or at least the, the biomarkers right. that suggest the quality of natural yeah. immunity, which is, which, is, yeah. which is very good. Because as you said, Omicron tended to be milder for most people. And I don't mean to, by, by saying this, I don't mean to trivialize anyone who had a bad outcome with Omicron. Certainly if you're in that older age bracket, um, it, could, it could get bad for you. But in a sense, because it was so infectious, because for almost everyone it was mild, Omicron was sort of the vaccine that we had really been been waiting for. Um, yeah, yeah. And your your remark about your adverse effect to the first vaccine um, mm -hmm. reminds me that that Drew, there are now about half a dozen studies. And I don't know that this is sufficiently definitive yet, but there's certainly suggestions in the literature. That if you've already had COVID and you have natural immunity, that you have a higher incidence of adverse effects from the vaccine than if you hadn't had I saw COVID that. and you get the vaccine. I saw that. Yep. I so, saw that. I mean, when I'm doing my calculation about whether or not to get the vaccine and, and, and get the, the so called hybrid immunity, which is I've got natural immunity, mm -hmm. get another dose of a vaccine to try to improve it even more, I saw that literature and I thought, huh, okay, well, yeah, I need to see some meaningful clinical benefit if I'm going to make that decision to go ahead and get vaccinated after I've recovered from COVID. Mm -hmm. And and what I saw, yeah. um, what I saw was it, the literature on hybrid immunity almost all focuses on uh, just on antibody levels, right? So you, mm -hmm. you get the vaccine, you get a boost in your antibody levels, but if you actually look Spy at the specifically outcomes, spikes. Yeah, specifically, exactly, exactly. But that you know, the, that's not necessarily reflected in better clinical outcomes when it comes to right. Um, right. you know hospitalization, severe symptoms, and and death. And part of the reason is natural immunity is already quite robust. It's it's hard to improve it even more when it's when it's functioning at a pretty high level already. And I would say that what I'm going to say next is still subject to controversy. And um, certainly the, the evidence on it is very preliminary, but there are some suggestions in the literature 
that vaccinating after natural immunity might actually impair your overall immunity because that, it, it, may, it may data, imprint. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's it, this idea of antigenic yeah. imprinting that it may focus it. Yeah, focus your response too narrowly on that original, uh, you know, alpha type spike protein, and with new variants where that spike protein continues to evolve to to try to evade immunity. Yeah. Um, you know, it may actually take you backwards from a, a more broad-based immunity to something that that becomes too focused by um, antibodies just to only one epitope or one antigen on the virus. Yeah. Yep, I get that, and I've seen that data, and I'm still for me, I'm still uh, watchful, waiting on that one. I'm still trying to trying to see if yeah. it's reconfirmed or same. Re- I'm not going to make but, the claim. But, yeah. Yeah. But let, let me, I'm going to stop and take a little break here, but I want you to think about something across the break. In, and I don't have an answer for this, and I, I would love your philosophy brain to, to help me. One of the concerns I have about, no one is saying the vaccines are 100% safe, right? There, there are, there are always, there's adverse reactions just from somebody walking in a doctor's office to get the vaccine, right? Iatrogenesis is all around yep. us. Um, sure. The, yeah. Uh, I and I've seen I've seen lots of side effects. I'm seeing lots of pot syndrome now. Lots of people passing out and sort of a lot of weird autonomic nervous system stuff. That that is that is on right now, and it's not really being as widely yeah. reported as I think I'm seeing it. Um, but I, it happened. It, happened, it was widely reported in terms of as a complication or of of COVID and a, a common thing in long COVID. But I'm seeing it from vaccine too. But okay, I don't know which is worse because they're not they're not they don't seem to be studying it. So I I just know it's there. But the point being. The ethical piece, that given we know that this vaccine does have some side effects, and we've all sort of taken the position that in certainly in the elderly population, it's well worth the risk. What are the ethics of making a person who is before you healthy, sick, as opposed to withholding a therapy that a healthy person as a result of the vicissitudes of living might unfortunately become infected by something that is worse than the potential side effects yeah. of the vaccine. Am I, am I stating this, this sort of, because yeah, no, uh, to me making it, I'm, I'm hang on, I'm, I'm going to make you wait across the commercials here. But, but the question really that I've been troubled with is what does it mean to make a healthy person sick? Right. What does that mean ethically? Because that's, when some of that starts happening, people are going to freak out, and it's inevitable given yeah. the vaccine, the the profile in the vaccine. So we'll talk about that and take calls right when we get back. Since the beginning of the pandemic, nearly one in five Americans has reported consuming an unhealthy amount of alcohol. Could be you, but only 10% of them are actually getting the help they need. Reframe is a neuroscience-based smartphone app that helps users cut back or quit drinking alcohol altogether. Using evidence-based tools, techniques, and content, Reframe guides users through a personalized program to help them reach their goals. Comprised of daily tasks, a comprehensive toolkit, a community forum, and accountability guides, Reframe is a modern, accessible, and affordable resource that can help anyone looking to reevaluate their relationship with alcohol. Reframe is backed by Harvard University and Emory University Schools of Medicine, and it is ranked the number one alcohol reduction smartphone app worldwide with over 350,000 downloads. With Reframe, there's no stigma, just science, no labels, just support. To learn more, go to joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Use the code Dr. Drew for 25% off your first month or your annual subscription. That's at joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Let's talk about our friends at Hydrolyte. I can't say enough about Hydrolyte. You hear me talk about them all the time. It gets me through workouts and medical procedures and colonoscopies and COVID. It absolutely contributed to my recovery from COVID. Hydration is key to feeling healthy, and there's never been a time when that could be more important. We're in the height of cold flu season. Every headache has got you testing for COVID. Staying hydrated can keep the questionable symptoms at bay, and there's nothing better than Hydrolyte to get it done. Taking their hydration formula one step further, now there is Hydrolyte Plus Immunity. It starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients, plus each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. 
Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water to make a great tasting drink that is a 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all natural flavors. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. That is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash Dr. Drew. And be sure to use that code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. We are back with Dr. Cariotti. We were talking about the ethics of vaccine therapies of various type, or really almost any therapeutics uh, or, or medical interventions. It's sort of an interesting question. Um, in, in my own mind, uh, when, I'm, when I risk making a healthy person sick, it's because there's going to be much more serious problems down the line if I don't. Uh, how do we understand that with this vaccine therapy? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And I think we need to begin, and most physicians need to begin, with that old Hippocratic adage, first, do no harm, do right? No harm. Primum, no, no chere. Yep. You might even yep. heard the Latin mm. if you were on the mm. wards as a medical student being quoted to you by the senior mm -hmm. physicians. And, mm -hmm. uh, and to, uh, to always avoid at all costs any harm to a patient would be impossible, right? Everything that we do as physicians has some attendant risks to it, mm -hmm. right? So if mm -hmm. if we if we absolutely one hundred percent wanted to avoid any harm, we would never do anything. Most patients are willing to take mm -hmm. on some degree of risk, but only when there's commensurate benefit, right? And only when we have mm -hmm. good reason and good evidence to believe that um, by assuming these risks, let's say of surgery, right, risks of infection or excess bleeding or whatever. Uh, that is associated with surgery or anesthesia, that that's that's going to be outweighed by the benefit of getting your appendix out before it ruptures. Okay. Right. When it comes to these vaccines, what I've seen is people willing to put some populations at some degree of risk when the benefits only yep. accrue to someone else. And that's where it gets ethically right. troubling. And I think to crystallize this, yes. we have to look at the, the push for vaccine mandates, COVID vaccine mandates for children. Now, when you vaccinate a child against measles, right, you're, uh, you're protecting the child against an illness that has a high likelihood, if they get it, of harming the child, right? It can harm other people as well. Uh, but the, the measles vaccine has some reasonable chance of benefiting that child, especially if vaccination rates fall too low in the population, you get an outbreak of this extremely contagious yeah. uh, illness. What's happening with and the more COVID dangerous vaccines, than people though, appreciate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but with with COVID, uh, I think it's accurate to say that healthy children are not at significant risk from COVID. A child with a rare uh, a serious condition might be a different story, but healthy children are not at significant morbidity and mortality risk from COVID. And yet, many of the arguments I'm seeing put forward for vaccine mandates for children with COVID rely on protecting grandma, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, mm -hmm. the vaccines don't prevent infection and transmission, so I think that argument doesn't work. Right. But even if we had a sterilizing That's vaccine right. for this, Drew, that argument... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. should be worrisome. And, and the reason is that a healthy society doesn't use children and put children at some degree of risk, however small that risk might be, we can argue about the risks, mm -hmm. but some degree of, of known and unknown risk for the sake of protecting grownups, right? A healthy and sane mm -hmm. society doesn't instrumentalize children to shield grownups from harm. We, we make sacrifices. We put ourselves in harm's way in order to protect children. And I think we need to sort of step back and think about what we're doing when we're putting children at some degree of risk. Uh, and, and we know that it's very unlikely to benefit those children. That's a very different moral calculus. Right. Yeah, it's like parents, for something it's making that, children the parents. Right, that's right. Which is not good. No, it's not good. I'm exactly. glad you responded to that, Susan. That's a good sign. She's I, leaned in on that one. Well, <laughs> like, I, you know... 
Because we, we've often talked about taking bullets for our kids. You know, it's a natural right. parental instinct to have a child take a bullet for us. Exactly. Forget it. And I, by the way, I said, exactly. I ask every doctor, if you're, you know, if your kid's six to eight or whatever, 10 or whatever, would you give them the vaccine? They always say no. Like, it's not necessary because if, if they get the virus, they're going to get through it so fast. They'll have better immunity. And, you know, don't take them to grandma's house. I mean, clearly you have to be super careful but um, if they have a sniffly nose, but kids are supposed to get viruses. Like mm -hmm. it's not, I had triplets. I know I was sick every month their whole <laughs> life until they were 18 and they would still go to school and they would still play sports. And if they had a runny nose or whatever, and some of these kids yeah. don't even know they have COVID. Right. Most of them. That's right. I they're supposed to trade that's, it off. That's what they're supposed to do at school. That's right. That's how, that's, that's how the take. immune system works. And as COVID mm -hmm. becomes endemic, um, the fact that children are not harmed by COVID is one of the few silver linings of this pandemic. Um, while there are still people yeah. in the population that were not exposed to COVID as children, we have to do everything we can to protect them, Susan, as, as you mentioned. Um, but with the children, uh, it's good for their immune system to get exposed to viruses that they can handle well because that's what tunes up and strengthens the immune system. If we try to sterilize their environment entirely, we can actually end up- It's not right. Uh, you know, producing a situation- When they get older, they'll just get sick all the time, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Like peanut allergies exactly. or whatever, you know. Peanut allergies. Yep. Whatever, you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Or they'll get histrionic too, because now we're telling them that they can't catch a cold. They have to wear a mask. They're, you know, if you get a runny nose, I, we're I all going to worry you, about you. Don't I, cough around your friends. And I then saw the when they get thing. old, they're all, they continue to act like that. I saw the saddest annoying. thing. There were these, there was a meme on something on, I guess, Instagram. I saw it was these two. Oh my God. It upsets me to think about this. These two, uh, probably fifth graders. I think it was a boy and a girl from, I, I can't, Tell you whether it's a boy or a girl, I'll tell you why in a second. From Ukraine had landed in Italy. And the first thing that Ukrainian parents tell you is we got to get these kids in school. We can't leave them out of school. You can't do that to children. Here we are, two and a half years in, no consideration for that. But okay, every other country is civil, you know, every other Western country is like, you gotta your kids gotta be in school. You can't let them fall by. No, not us. Yeah. Just let it let it be, everybody. But okay, so they got they get to Italy. These two kids with their little backpacks are walking into this school and the entire school turns out and because they really, you could tell they didn't speak Italian and they were nervous and the whole school shows up and gives them applause. Everyone in a mask. So I couldn't tell what people were feeling. I could just see them <laughs> clapping their hands. Every single person yeah. in a mask. I couldn't tell whether the, stu the Ukrainians were a boy and girl or not. I think it was a boy and a girl. I don't know. Uh, but everyone <laughs> in a mask. So the entire impact Strikes of back. this incredible yeah. um, uh, outpouring was lost. I couldn't figure it out. Imagine what a f fifth grader is feeling. Yeah. Confusion is what I would have felt. They're applauding. Are they... Is this yeah. a good thing or a bad thing? I can't see anybody's faces. It's going to give it us really a mental was awful. disorder. It really was terrible. It really cut, cut through to me. It's but like, isn't God. that the plan? Isn't that the plan? The plan is what? To Susan? screw up our society? with a Who's with plan? A, I, just, I don't know. If that was making a... <laughs> Susan, you need a Susan strike if back. I, if but I was I, making I, a I, virus to, you know, in a no, lab no, to, no, for you know, some uh, man, maybe, covert but if you reason, really get, if you really I would want to make uh, everybody if, lose their mind If you really get conspiratorial, time. I'm going to send you to Dr. Cariotti, so be careful. I know. So, no, I'm just saying it's... And, it, and it, by the way, it's to, a crazy that, virus. To, to that point, Dr. Cariotti, I... I have seen so many. Yeah, but we're following on, the. the we're following. I have a real point to make. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I have seen so many in this country express notions that are frankly delusional. That I, I honest to goodness, if they expressed them three years prior, I would have urged psychiatric hospitalization. And yet, delusionality seems to. Doctor McCullough called it mass psychosis or whatever. I saw it before he started talking about it that I was just hearing delusional yeah. thinking about Nazis and Russians and <laughs> you know and viruses and end well, of world and blah 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 blah. That would be a uh, you would go into a hospital for that thinking, and yet it was commonplace. What what was that? What do you think? So what I was seeing in the in the early stages of the pandemic, especially, and it continued for many people for a long time, 
was uh, I was getting patients a couple of weeks into lockdowns. And this is one of the things that sort of it triggered my, uh, my anti-prolonged lockdown stance. I supported two weeks to flatten the curve yeah. because I was, yeah, me too. I was, yeah. I was, I was writing the university of California's uh, pandemic triage policy yeah. and thinking through yeah, yeah. worst case scenarios. Um, but yeah. as that continued beyond that initial two weeks, I was seeing, uh, patients in the psychiatric clinic who were not, uh, manic or psychotic they didn't have cognitive disorders that would make them delusional but they literally thought the apocalypse was near they were watching you know cnn yep. for six hours a day and yep. they were they were paralyzed with terror and they literally thought the world was was falling apart hey, that i had someone i had a news producer in a newsroom come up to me and say you figure this is the uh what do they call it uh the, you figure this is an extinction event? Like he was dead serious. Like this is an extinction event, right? I'm like, what? What are you? T what are you talking about? We had a we had a real real pandemic. We had a pandemic in the 80s with a 100 percent fatality rate associated with it. Why didn't you guys freak out with that one? Anyway, so continue. Right. What, what do you right. think that was? Well, there were there were polls that came a few months after that showing that many Americans grossly overestimated the case fatality and the infection fatality rates. People who thought that, you know, middle-aged individuals, if they get COVID, have a 50-50 chance of dying, which was just outlandishly uh, exaggerated. And I think part of the reason for that, Drew, is that people have a hard time thinking, most people have a hard time thinking statistically. This is why anecdotes become right. powerful for people That's because right. we right. remember things and we, we emotionally resonate with stories yeah. um, and first person yeah. impacts. And if I know a loved one yeah. who got really sick with COVID and ended up in the ICU, I'm just going to pay attention to the information I'm getting and, and interpret it very differently than if yeah. you know I got COVID, had an extremely mild case and nothing bad happened. And and so I yeah. think the inability to think statistically was was amplified by irresponsible public health reporting. Right. And we know now that's right that yeah. we know now that fear was deliberately used. You know, the behavioral nudge unit in, in Great Britain and, and other consultants in the United States advising that we ramp up fear in order to try to induce the behavioral outcomes that we want so that people Crazy. will obey Crazy. the stay at home order or the vaccine Crazy. recommendation or whatever. And that's, um, you know, what, what I saw, it, it, this is how I'll, this is how, how I'll explain it. What I saw instead of taking complex and evolving information and trying to make it intelligible to, to the average person, which is what you try to do. I think on yep. this, sh on this show, yep. take complex science, Yep. and make it readily accessible. Yep. And in the course of doing that, you're going to oversimplify at times. And that's that's okay. Yeah, maybe. That's, that's yeah. perfectly legitimate yeah. because you're trying to educate people and not everyone is going to have a PhD in you know immunology. Fine. Instead of doing that, instead of taking complex information, try to, ma try to make it accessible to the average person. What we did instead was we, we started with the behavioral outcome that we wanted. We said, we want people to do X, stay at home, wash their hands, uh, take the jab, whatever. And so we're only going to give them information that we believe will encourage them to do X. And we're going to suppress or ignore or avoid giving information that we think would discourage that behavior, even if that information is true, right? But when you start doing that, even if you have good intentions, and even if the behaviors you're trying to encourage are a good idea, which you're essentially engaged in is propaganda, and the long-term costs of doing that, I think, grossly uh, outweigh any potential short-term benefits because basically you're eroding public trust. People still have access to information. And if you don't, if you refuse to mention any of the adverse effects of the vaccine, for example, people are going to still find out about the adverse effects of the vaccines, right? They're just not going to hear it from the trusted authority, which means next time around, they're not going to trust the public health authorities when they say this which, thing which is, is so weird which is so weird because 
during the AIDS epidemic, we, we studied this most carefully, how to adjust very powerful, motivated behaviors, sexual behaviors, and we figured it out. And fear and shame and guilt were the... Right. We, that was anathema to everything we were doing. It's just so exactly. weird that that was all chucked yeah. during this one. It was, it was humor and music and narratives and relatable stories and things like that, not, not yeah. Hannocksville. It's, the weirdest question I got ever was... You know, when I got sick with COVID, and I was very sick with it, the universal question was, were you scared? It's like, was I scared? I had a 1% fatality rate. Why would I even be thinking about that? I mean, it's just like, when a doctor tells you you have a 99% survival, that's telling you you're going to survive, good. period. Now, don't even worry about it. Yeah, like, it which was I did rough, not. though. It was yeah, rough. I was sick, and no, I had all kinds bad. of horrible... No, it was bad. I mean, some people didn't survive, but... Um... You know, the thing I... Yes, 1% in my age group, 1% didn't now survive. Now that we've flattened the curve, sort of. Uh, um, yeah. it, I mean, I just, you know, I hear stories about, we had this guy on a couple of weeks ago or a week ago where his son was 16, had myocarditis and died, like 16. And, and from, the just, from the vaccine. It's heart. It's yeah. heartbreaking yes. because... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It was totally unnecessary. And maybe if you know, like, yeah. your kid has, you know, pre-existing con no, conditions or whatever. No, this isn't a pre-existing thing. It just, it a just, happens. Event. It just yeah. happens. Yeah, and I that that just breaks my heart because yes, that's what we were talking about. And I'm not I'm not anti-vax. I've had three vaccinations and I still got COVID, right. and I yeah. think I'm fine now. I can I can go. I've been to two major cities yeah. and not worn a mask, and I haven't caught it again. So mm -hmm. I yeah. think I'm okay. But if I do get it again, I I won't care. You know, I, it wasn't that bad, yep. and I'm old. I'm 62. <laughs> so. So let's let I want to. I mean, I'm I'm hitting that age. I guess maybe in a. You're bionic though. In ten years, anything. yeah, I know. But like, if we waited five years, I'd probably get another vaccine because they'd have new ones that were more. I you I can't even I I can't make it's hard enough to make predictions about next year. Five years, I'm not right. But and uh, also, right. I had I had the Pfizer booster for the for the Delta. I didn't have it for the Omicron. Yeah, Omicron. Like, that's true. What what did I take the wrong one? Well, I had a. What I'm advocating for, Susan. Year. Just, just to your point, what I'm advocating for is that people be given the choice to make that the healthcare decision regarding vaccine that's best for them and their children. In the case you mentioned, the myocarditis in the 16-year-old, this is precisely why I'm working with the Unity Project in California to advocate for the right of informed consent and to push back against not vaccines, but against vaccine mandates, against those policies that take away parents' ability to assess their individual child's risk along with, you know, and, and in collaboration with their physician, uh, because no one should, no one should have their ability to go to school or to travel or to work contingent on accepting a medical procedure that may or may not in an individual case be in their right. best interest. I know. Yeah. Or you, we had to wear masks last week outside in Pasadena. Okay, we live in the we most did. virtuous signaling city in the United States. We were voted the snobbiest um, city in the United States. Now well, I, I don't know. Why. San Jose, because, because everybody was Pasadena run for its money, but yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I hear you. South Pasadena is even worse. I was like, why is everybody wearing a mask outside? I didn't even know it was a thing. I didn't know it was a rule. It, I, it I, is a thing because we it was. And remember, Barbara Ferrer was like, you have to wear them outside, and then you have well, to wear them inside. That's over, thank God. But I mean, everybody was wearing them on a Saturday afternoon that's outside, ridiculous. and I said, well, I guess I feel safer now. I don't know. I like Pasadena, but. I don't, I, I think it's just, we're, we're pushing it a little too far. You know, we scared the shit out of everybody in California. That's right. And I, really I don't did. like that either. What have we done to people? What have we done? Yeah. Uh, the what fear, have we done? The fear, hey, let me ask something very else. Very harmful. Very harmful. Yeah. Um, there, there's an aspect to the mandates that I, I, I was concerned about from the beginning and has not been seemingly catching much wind. And that is that, you know, if you look at a population that is under vaccinated and with higher risk, it's the African American community. And in many major metropolitan areas, they were overtly uh, discriminated against for their their choice not to get the vaccine. And the the That's right. and again, I'm now, now I'm going to pull on your medical ethics. So the the argument was, well, they've chosen it, therefore it's really not discrimination. My position was, They've chosen it because our profession has not built a proper trust 
relationship with that community and has ill served them over many generations. And of course they don't trust the vaccine and that's on us, yeah. not on them. And it's really not a choice. It's a function of history. And why aren't people exactly upset right. about that? That's exactly right. So the vaccine passport system, which was very often tied up with the vaccine mandate policies in many jurisdictions, was de facto discriminatory because we know that uh, Blacks and uh, Hispanics were uh, vaccinated at much lower rates than the general population. And for the, for the very reasons that you mentioned, uh, Drew, that historically, Blacks have what may, you, you could argue, is a, is a healthy mistrust of a public health establishment that has, in fact, failed them over many, many decades mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And the infamous Tuskegee mm -hmm. syphilis experiments are the, the kind of the most notorious example of that failure. And for listeners who aren't aware of what happened there, this was basically between, uh, you know, for a 40, 50 year period, starting in the 1920s and, and not ending until the early 1970s. There were African-American, poor, disenfranchised African-American men in the South who were uh, basically su subjected to experimental conditions where they were not treated for a known infection of sy syphilis. And this was sponsored by the U.S. federal government, the U.S. public health agency at the federal level at the time. And basically what happened is during this, this study period, penicillin was developed and then it became known that penicillin mm -hmm. was a treatment and it could cure a syphilis infection. And yet these men in the study were not offered that treatment. Why weren't they offered that treatment? Well, the researchers wanted to look at the natural history of the illness, meaning what happens to a person as syphilis progresses through its primary, secondary, tertiary phases. And so they were denied treatment that was readily available and that we knew could have cured them. Some of them infected their wives. Some of the wives infected children during childbirth. And finally, a, a reporter blew the whistle on this in the 1970s. And it took two decades. It wasn't until the 1990s that President Clinton publicly apologized for this egregious abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mm -hmm. said, that's the most famous example of, that, uh, of the Black population in this country being uh, mistreated by the public health establishment. But, but there, it's, there are it's many, far many from the others. Only example. Man, That's man, right. right. And That's right. particularly on the mental health side. The mental health side, it's, it's all look, just at the just take a look at the um the Kentucky um <laughs> lab that they maintain, the Lexington lab that the federal government's maintained. You, do you know about this? The the opiate study labs and the L S D lab, all this stuff down most of those subjects were black. Oh, you don't know about the Lexington uh, lab? No. No, I wasn't aware of. This. Oh, it's fantastic! I'll have to look it up after. Oh, let me let me look up the name of it. It's got a it's got a great name, but it, it's it's where they first studied uh, actually opiate withdrawal and, and made a syndrome out yeah. of it and a treatment for it. Yeah. Uh, but it, this thing has a funny name. I'm going to look it up. Hold on a second. Federal, uh, the Lexington Lab. They're just in Lexington. Blah, 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 blah. Mm. Uh, they're not really. I'm going to look up Kentucky. So when, they closed, they closed it in, they closed in the seventies because they were doing horrible. Yeah. It's where a yeah. lot of that, um, the LSD stuff was being done, you know, all those crazy yeah. CIA studies and stuff. Uh, they yep. were doing yep. some of it there. And uh, so, so Kentucky federal labs, here it is. Uh -huh. Funny. It doesn't pop right up. You would think Oak Ridge. No, that's a, oh, well, anyway, it doesn't come right up for me, which is weird. I used to give a lecture about it. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a troubling, it's a troubling fact of, and it's sort of a dark chapter of American history, that the history of the public health establishment in the United States is very much bound up with the history of the eugenics movement in the United States, mm -hmm. the, 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 the push right. in the early 20th century for racial purity. That's and we right. tend to think of the Nazis when we think about the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement started mm -hmm. in Great Britain in the United States, and it was only later exported to Germany. We had 27 mm -hmm. states uh, that permitted the involuntary sterilization of um, so-called mentally defective individuals uh, throughout most of the 20th century. Those laws were were in effect. And if you look at the people who were actually involuntarily sterilized under those laws, uh, women and blacks and other ethnic minorities were disproportionately represented, much higher rates 
than, Absolutely. you know, the, the rates Absolutely. in the general population. Yep. So one of my, uh, one of my very favorite uh, TV shows, a show called the Nick, if you want to watch a great uh, show about the history of medicine, it's about a hospital at the turn of the 20th century and they get deep into this. It's, it's all around yeah. them as they are, you know, cause there was several of the attending physicians were strong advocates of this stuff. And it's, uh, it was here it, make no mistake. It was here. And it was mainstream. It was supported by uh, Rockefeller yeah. and Carnegie and the major foundations. The, the, the founding yeah, president it gives me, it, you don't like to think Stanford about it. University was a, yeah, died in the wool eugenicist. So this was not a fringe movement in the United States. This was very much uh, mainstream and, and widely embraced in the early 20th century. So the Lexington, it's the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, the Addiction Research Center. They called it, and uh, they did a lot of screwy stuff there. I assure you. Let's um, let's take some calls. I, there's all kinds of stuff I want to talk about, but we've had a bunch of hands up here. I want to get to some people if we possibly can. Uh, Steve, your hand has been up quite some time. Steve K, I'm gonna give you a chance to come up here. If you do come up, you are agreeing to be streamed on multiple platforms. Steve, what's going on? Hey, Dr. Drew. Hey there. Um, uh, Dr. Drew, Dr. Cariotti, thank you for your activism. Uh, I appreciate you standing up for the doctor-patient relationship. I know it takes a lot Thanks. of courage to do that right now. My, my is, first That's so weird. That's weird for you even to say that. That's I, it's, <laughs> And to be fair, Dr. It's Cariotti is standing up in the court. So I'm just I'm just investigating things. But go ahead. Okay, so let's talk about that. Well, I had two questions. The first, the first one was on mass formation and psychosis, which we already covered. Yeah. had a great discussion about that. The second one yeah. was thinking on a larger level. Mm. Okay, we're dealing with billions of dollars, lots of money and power. Mm. We have right. two kids that play soccer. We do not want them to take this shot. Um, you know, we've read dozens of stories about kids collapsing on the fields playing soccer. Is there is there a larger organization, a lobbying organization in D.C. that will represent physicians like you who are advocating for the for the importance of the of the doctor patient relationship is there a large organization you may, can i put you on hold here or is there a follow-up question then i'll let sure no nope, okay, that's it don't carry on. And, yeah. and let me just say the 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 fact that they did not approve covaxin with no explanation is deeply concerning to me i think novavax is now available i think i would urge you to take a good look at those vaccines because you may find that you'll be you'll be open to doing that, and particularly Novavax is just a protein. I mean, if if you know if it's if it's causing chaos in your life, not to get vaccinated, look at some of the newer vaccines as they evolve. Dr. Coriardi, go ahead. Your answer his question. Yeah. So, yeah, Steve, continue to get educated. I am going to defend your right of informed consent and informed refusal. As to organizations in D.C., off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any, but I would mm -hmm. say go to the Unity Project website and look at our partner organizations. A lot of those partner organizations are in California because that's where uh, this group started. But the purpose of the Unity Project is to, is to unite other grassroots groups that are working on this issue of parental informed consent rights. And so there, it may very well be that one of our national partners has a chapter in DC. And so I think that would be a good place to start uh, and, and to make an inquiry to answer your, your question. But you know, certainly I think parents, at this point, parents need to band together and get involved in some of these efforts so that their their rights to make medical decisions on behalf of their children don't continue to be steamrolled. It, it's interesting that it, it seems like moms are having a massive impact on some of the excesses that are going on yeah. in this country right now. And I find it interesting that Susan leaned in on some of the stuff you were saying about, yeah, yeah. like the kids, the, that, Susan, that seemed to speak to you pretty loudly, the idea that kids are being sacrificed to the adults. I mean, that's the most anathema. Or they have to parent them because I know a lot of kids are like, oh, I have to get the vaccine because I don't want to kill grandma or I want to make sure I get it. And the parents are like, do I have to do this? Like, Let, let me bring up something I always bring up, which is, no one ever asked the elderly population what they even want to do with, with these risks. <laughs> right. Do you want to not see your grandkids or do you want to take a little right. risk and see the grandkids? I have both in my, right. my practice. I have patients that are going, yeah, we, I will not see my kids. I've not seen them in two years and that's fine. And I have other people going, Psh, I'm, I'm, I only have a year or two left. I'm yeah. going to spend that without my grandkids. Are you kidding me? Why would I do that? Why would I, why would I sacrifice a minute of that? And, and again, because I, 
I'm an internist. I deal with geriatric populations a lot. Talk to your family. I've said it on this stream many times, whether or not you ever want to be in a nursing home. The average life expectancy, average, or maybe the mean, it might be the median, after admission to a nursing home is six months. And if you're so bad, if you're so far gone that you need two people to turn you, feed you, okay, you first of all, you may not want five more minutes of that, which I don't. And number right. two, I the know. probability of you living very long is at that point extremely low. So why? Why yeah. put people through that? No, but it's also the the kids are sort of, they have to play off the other parents and the other kids at school. And That's true. They have to do what their Good friends point. are doing. Good and point. They, or you know, they're pretty much gun ho about it because they've had millions of vaccinations. But mm -hmm. I think if I had to choose between my three kids, even though they were all born at the same time, I probably wouldn't have given it to the boys, but I would have given it to Polly. Because <laughs> I don't know why. They just, they're always, they get sick more and they always had more problems and maybe they'd have an adverse reaction to it. Yeah, well, guess Pauline what? Is like guess me. what? M women's mother's instincts are valuable. Guess what? They're valuable. Absolutely. And if I were a pediatrician, I, I listen to them all the time when I deal with adolescents. Anyone. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and they yeah, they'd no have way. to get it probably because they were in football and they were in the musical and they are, they couldn't just study at home. If they were doing at school, they'd be they'd say it's mandated if you're going to be in the uh, in the play in order to be in it, you have to have a vaccine. So they'd have to get it, and then I'd have to suck it up. You know, but if I was just you know living in the middle of nowhere and didn't have to worry about them you know, being part of a sport, then I would probably think a little differently about it. It's so nice. But I, my daughter was a figure skater, though. But I would be like, if you were in an ice rink, you know, you, you, you're not really close to anybody. You're at least six feet apart from everybody when you're doing a double axle. So I don't, I couldn't understand, like in the Olympics, why the kid who had COVID couldn't com compete, you right. know. They, right. they put him in the middle of an ice rink, right. you know. 100 yards away from the fans the, the many look the, the, that's a whole other and i'll uh th serve this one up to you dr Cariotti. Wh why did we why did everybody should be so glad that i don't have young kids right now so so the <laughs> reason crazy. the reason that china did Mama fairly Bear. well with the pre with the pre omicron outbreaks was because they did infectious disease the way infectious disease has always been done they did local they did local lockdowns, local um, quarantines. They did not do any kind of national, they would never contemplate national lockdowns. And yet we in this country had editorial boards of the New York Times and other non-clinical people mandating a national lockdown yeah. and fashioning that yeah. lockdown after what they imagined was going on as 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 perpetrated by the Chinese Communist Party. It was they even the Chinese Communist Party didn't contemplate anything as severe as what we did here. And yet we were fashioning what we were doing after them. I, again, the cognitive distortions uh, uh, yep. galore. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Lockdowns were a totally untested intervention. We've been dealing with epidemics and pandemics for centuries actually drew and you can look back from the, the lepers of the old testament and the jewish laws to to quarantine them um, had an infectious disease component they didn't understand the germ theory of disease they didn't know why this worked but they you know people figured things out the uh, justinian plague mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the roman empire uh in the in the third century again had there were there were local responses to this in terms of quarantining the sick and social distancing mm -hmm. that made sense but never mm -hmm. before in, in human history in the management of pandemics have we quarantined healthy populations and the reason that we have never done contemplated that is because it doesn't it doesn't work it's never been contemplated yeah. it's yeah. never been tested it's never been yeah. done before <laughs> yeah. and we know now in retrospect yeah. that it didn't it didn't work right a majority of americans now have been still been infected with COVID in spite of the prolonged lockdowns of 2020 yeah, and, and, and 2021. If it worked, I would be an, I'd be an enthusiast if these things worked, if there was even modest evidence that they worked, but there's categorical okay, evidence so that they do not. Okay, so it's been a couple of years, so oh, now we yeah. have a historical perspective. And oh, I, do we? At That's the beginning, the problem. At the, at the beginning, I said, history is not going to be kind to how we're handling this. You did say that. Yeah. And yeah, and I, yeah. We're, now we're like in, now people are looking back and going, yeah, we could have done this a little differently. Are they? I don't, I don't feel that they're looking at this with the yeah. same enthusiasm. Behind closed or, doors. Behind boy, I, everybody be, we've spoken our to. Our profession, uh, Aaron, should be, should be absolute, we should be spilling more ink on this topic than anything else. I and totally yet, agree. I don't see it. 
I don't see yeah, it. I don't see a huge well. appetite for a stringent postmortem of the pandemic. Susan, I do agree with you that a lot of people are 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 saying and admitting that many of these policies were misguided. Oh, gee, it looks like in retrospect they didn't work. But to actually wrap your head around what that means and you know the collateral damage that was done by a, a policy like yeah. lockdowns or the you know thousands of people that lost their jobs over vaccine mandates mental that likely didn't have oh my god public, my kids yeah, the, have the, problems the mental like, illness. i mean i have yeah. three 29 year olds living with me and trust me it's it's pretty somber over here on certain days yeah you know and so i'm enough. i'm not used to that i i i'm glad yeah. they're here and they're safe but not everybody has that not everybody has parents to go live with and and pick up their lives you know they they lost two years of their lives in their 20s i mean not that that's a big deal they're they're gonna be fine but but I, still it's they're they're very upset about it and it's the ptsd is yeah. you know i don't I, know i, I think right i don't know so. if i'm gonna be and, and a good I, enough mother to pull them out of it but <laughs> And I, I like well, you to use the term "good enough mother" because that's actually a that's actually a formal psychiatric term. So please just keep focusing right. on "good that's enough right. mother." That's Wait, what is it? <laughs> what did I say? Oh no, you said I'm "good enough mother." It's a great term. It's a great term. Oh, I, I, good. You, you you pulled it right. It was Dr. Sullivan was that who invented that uh, uh, in your psychiatric history. Winnicott. Yeah, it's it, there was there yeah, was yeah, a major Winnicott. theorist I read that in book. attachment theory um, that, yeah. that talked yeah. about. That's yeah, why yeah, I remember it from. Perfect parent to get good outcomes with your children. Thank goodness, it's right? Good enough. The good enough mother good enough. would be good, would be good enough. Um, I, I probably I, would have I, gone into psychology if I didn't have triplets. So there you go. That's probably true. Well, if if a mom of tri triplets mm -hmm. automatically has the equivalent of a PhD in psychology, as, as far as I'm concerned, so parenting is an I, PhD I, in I, life I, in and of itself, right? I, I, exactly. I agree exactly. with you. Uh, Scooby Snack is. Uh, I've asked you to come up here if you wish. Uh, yeah, somebody named Scooby Snack. Uh, if he, there you are, Tom. Hey, Doctor. Uh, hey, Tom. What's yes, up? It's Tom. Hey, buddy. Hey, uh, always love listening to the program. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to just throw out one quick point for you folks. When you know, it is easy to talk in retrospect. You know how what policies worked and what policies didn't work, but you know. I, I, one thing I wanted to mention, I mean, almost a million Americans did die. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's significant, right? Yeah, oh, this, this, look, this sucked. It was not that it didn't suck and it wasn't a big mess. Uh, it was, it was terrible. Um, and, and, and the one thing I wanted to mention, I was trying to uh, do this, I think, on Twitter or something initially, but I think the one thing that I think is, I, you know, that I hear everyone talk about is these mandates and how terrible they are. But I know when the vaccines first came out for the wild type, or I don't know the exact medical term, but for the original strains, Alpha, they were, yeah. yeah, they were 98 to 99% effective, not only in preventing death, correct me if I'm wrong, but also in preventing spread of infection. We thought Is so. We thought, we thought so. so. Yeah. And, and I remember reading, and, and, and I'll, you're going to laugh, I actually have not had the vaccine, and nor, nor has my family, but and it's for a different because we don't actually have to be exposed to the public on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And we do wear N95 masks when we do uh, expose ourselves to, we, we, we don't, you know, we don't choose to eat indoors or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. We still enjoy our life and all that good stuff. Now, will we get the vaccine down the road? Yeah. But what we were reading on as data was being released was as these mutations were happening, we were reading in real time, eh, it looks like there might be some breakthrough mm -hmm. and looks like the vaccine may not be all that effective. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just want to throw that out there. So I, I, in my opinion, anyway, it seems like a lot of this policy was made in real time mm -hmm. as the data was being released. And I don't think the policies were ever updated properly uh, to follow right. the fact that, hey, these yes. vaccines really yes. weren't all that effective as the virus No, mutated. no, Tom, that's one Tom. of the things we are we are sort of, it, yeah, you're, you're putting your finger on the exact thing, and if we didn't articulate this sufficiently, this is the exact thing that bothers us. Bureaucrats yeah. and the people in these public health positions are not able 
to take adequate risk reward analysis. They can't change direction. They can't admit when they're wrong. Right. They can't do all the things that a clinician can do when that one person is there for one patient, which is where we think all this should be directed to medicine to be practiced again is all we're sure. sort of advocating. And that the, the centralized bureaucratic authoritarian stuff doesn't work as well. If it worked well, again, I'd be all for it. It just no, doesn't one, work. But, the one thing to throw out there real quick, and then I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. let you guys say. So my buddy Brian and I, we, we, we've talked and we've been actively involved in following the data from the beginning. So we said, today, Brian, what if you went ahead and took Australia's numbers, and mm -hmm. some people think Australia was terrible, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and their uh, tyrannical lockdowns and everything else. But we ran the numbers backwards, and I said, just theoretically, if you took Australia's death per capita, and you applied it to the United States, which I know it's not necessarily completely fair to do, but just something to throw out there. We would have lost 70,000 as opposed to almost 1 million U.S. citizens if, magically, we could have followed the same strategy. And one more thing to mention, their current inflation rate in Australia as of about four weeks ago is right around 3.5%, mm -hmm. as opposed to our massive inflation in our economy. So anyway. I, I, I'm, ha hang, I'm having a hard time um, getting my head around what you're saying because it, yeah. it doesn't fit. Go, I'll let Dr. Cariotti say this. Hold, stay on the line sure. with us. Yeah, go ahead. Cariotti, sure. go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple of comments. First, first of all, anytime we're going to do a comparison of how populations fare with something like COVID, um, and you may have been quoting age-adjusted mortality statistics, but if not, make sure, you know, we need to make sure that we're looking at age-adjusted mortality statistics so that we're not comparing a population that's overall younger to a population that's overall older. That can really sort of confound a comparison and make, make it apples to oranges rather than apples to apples. So that's one, that's one caveat about you know, comparison between, between countries. Um, another caveat is that for the, the countries like Australia or um, or Indonesia that had some of these island nations that had more stringent lockdowns and really worked hard to keep uh, COVID out of you know out of their country and and out of their borders. Um, they were they may island. be at a very different. They, they may be at a very different place in the overall pandemic than the rest of us because they may have much lower levels of infection induced immunity. So. The fact that the virus is never going away and becoming endemic means that everyone eventually is going to get exposed to it. And if vaccine efficacy wanes starting at about four months, um, it's probably better to expo get exposed to it shortly after you're vaccinated so, so, than so a year So now we're, we're getting, yeah, we're getting Tom into speculative territory. So, so essentially what he's saying is it's a temporal issue and we haven't, you know, each, each, Right. region has its own temporal course with this and when we all get we should based on current available wisdom that may or may not be right everybody's going to get to the same place no matter what they do right that that's you know the time I, I course guess. is going to be the time course but everyone's going to the same place and i would tr point you to south korea and i think taiwan we're going through that right now and by the way the one thing i was going to mention and, and again this is just from i'm, I'm not a doctor mm -hmm. but one thing that i noticed with australia wasn't their vaccine uh, efficacy, what, wasn't their rate like up in the high 90s before they kind of let loose on their restrictions, or am I wrong on that? I couldn't tell you. Do you have any idea, Dr. Cariotti? I don't know. I, I have not seen ev any evidence that vaccine efficacy has varied by region. Um, so vaccine efficacy mm -hmm. seems most tied to the variance in circulation and the length of time since vaccination. Those seem to be the, the factors that it, replicated studies have shown to uh, to affect um, uh, vaccine efficacy. So I'm not aware of um, a higher efficacy of vaccines in one country uh, versus um, another unless they were perhaps using different different vaccines, which some countries and thank have Thank you, done. Tom. We're going to have to. So that, that's important. Yeah. Yes. And I think the newer, I think some of the new vaccines are going to be useful. Uh, I also think therapeutics change everything and the fact that we're not sort of yeah. analyzing what's likely to happen going forward in the context of excellent therapeutics. I, I don't understand that. 
between Paxlovid yeah, and that's right. In fact, I saw an article this morning. Saw an article this morning. In spite of um, grave concerns, you know, a Merck product being used widely, it's like what what are the grave concerns? <laughs> this is an old medicine. What what are you what are you talking about? What are we what are we doing here? It's it, it's been widely studied. They did huge analysis on molnupiravir and Paxlovid. Looks great, efficacious, safe. Um, if I got exposed, I'd probably take molnupiravir. If I got sick, I would definitely take yeah. Paxlovid. And that's that. And that's the end of this thing. Why are we not getting, that's another to me, public health failure. It should be, here's how to do telehealth if you get sick. Here are the therapeutic options. Here's what to know about monoclonal antibodies. And, and that's it. That They should be educating. Wasn't public health mostly an educational sort of kind of administrative limb for, throughout history as it pertains to right. what doctors did with their patients? It was mostly providing information. Why aren't they, they've given that up completely. And public health has also avoided talking about modifiable risk factors, right? So yeah, if you're vitamin D yep. deficient, getting your vitamin D levels up, uh, diet, exercise, all the things that we know strengthen mm -hmm. immunity. And aside from age, uh, the, the strongest risk factor for bad outcomes from COVID seems to be obesity. Uh, that's a difficult to modify risk factor, but it is modifiable. And I would have loved to see the public health. I've noticed a lot of people losing weight now, to help trying to get down. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, I good. mean, I've noticed that good. people are aware of that now. So well, yeah, that's a good thing, right? I mean, yeah, because it's that is a big factor. Yeah. Well, we've gone and way... without feeling shame, just going, huh? I better be get healthy. Maybe I have. I, uh, lose some I weight. have. Uh, Take my vitamin D, my C, my zinc. Yep, I, I agree with you, and I have. Um, uh, abused Dr. Cariotti's time. I've gone way over the, the time we expected. He was awesome. Yes, you're great. And uh, thank you to one of your residents who recommended you to, to us. Um, I hope you're still, uh, I, there's a whole other topic I'd love to see you get involved with, which is homelessness and uh, availability of yeah. proper care for serious mental illness, and which is, uh, I guess the talk. governor was love starting to talk, to talk about sanely that. about that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it seemed like he's sort of like he must have had somebody close to him get serious mental illness because for the first time in his career, he talks sanely about homelessness and mental illness. So maybe we could do something on that uh, at a future date. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. That's a, that's a really important topic, okay. especially here in my home yeah. state of California. It sounds like you're in California as well. So, uh, yeah, we're in Pasadena. I've been screaming about this for, uh, let's see, today's uh, Monday, about uh, 10 years. And uh, and the, my my reason is I I ran a large addiction recovery program. I had this rare experience in 1991 where I f I was asked to be the 1990 I was asked to be the assistant director of a drug and alcohol unit in a psychiatric hospital, a, a large psychiatric hospital with a large drug treatment program, to which the director whom I was supporting quit uh, like six months after I took the assistant directorship. So all of a sudden I moved into a directorship position. And for an internist to have that position was so crazy, I really took it yeah. very seriously and hung on to it and did it for 25 years. And um, it was an interesting experience to sit at the crossroads of psychiatry and medicine and family, their, you know, family interventions and yep. psychology. Yep. And I mean, it was everything, toxicology. You know, it's, that's the great thing about addiction. It's all sort of, and neuroscience was sort of my thing in college. And so it suited my what I was interested in, and boy, it was great, a great You experience. were wonderful. Let the guy go. All right, I was just telling him so he knows when we talk about homelessness, he knows who he's talking to, that's all. No, Gene um, knows a lot about and, it, and so complains I, about it a lot. And, and let me also, so that's why I could see my patients in the streets and I knew what could be done for them as opposed to what yeah. was being done. I, I also have yeah. grave concerns about your primary care colleagues doing all the prescribing of psychotropics. When, when I got to the psychiatric hospital as a moonlighting internist, uh, in 1985, I was interested in psychiatry. I thought I knew a lot, realized I didn't know shit. And after being there for 30 years, know that you always must consult with your psychiatric colleagues. I, you know, I can know a lot and still not know shit. And so yeah. I, I hope people are consulting properly these days. I, they're not enough psychiatrists, bottom line. And um, so yeah. I'm glad you're there training them. Well, I'm happy to put God on my psychiatrist you. hat and come back and chat with you. I really enjoyed this conversa conversation right. with, with you and Susan. And where would you like to send people? The Unity Project, anywhere else? Yeah, I, uh, I publish regular updates on my Substack newsletter. So aaronkariati.substack.com, or you can just Google 
Aaron Cariotti, Human Flourishing is the name of that newsletter, and you'll find it online. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. Oh, and uh, we will go. We've gone way over. So, so somebody named Makai had a question. Okay. And she was like, are you looking at us? And I said, well, we Mackay don't. Smith. I want to explain something Mackay to everybody Smith. out there. We do see it go by, but we're if he's interviewing somebody, sometimes he doesn't really look at the questions and read well, them. Here's what happens. So, so thank you, Susan, for bringing that up. But we um, will, but we will re answer questions. I see a lot of stuff go by. Some of it I try to kind of type in while I'm also doing an interview. So we're multitasking multiple things. Susan's actually running things. I type things in and yeah, they go, she'll pick stuff Drew up. Say that? Yeah, we always try <laughs> to pick things out. We when when I get in deep with a conversation in the stream, I will often look away for up to five to seven minutes and stuff will go by that I just didn't see. But I know Well, that. you can tell if he's engaged with a guest if he's not typing a lot. Right. Well, it's not even a gauge. I, 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 I sort of try to keep it's up a, with you guys. It, it just shows that he likes the guest better if he's not typing a lot. No, no, I really, I try, I try, and and uh, and there's been a lot of interesting. Most comments. of the typing's coming from me, so a lot of interesting comments made on the restream. I thought today too. So okay, and, so read Mackay's question. Uh, I can't get back to it. It's scrolled up. I, I, let me I can't find get, it. I can't I'll find. And you're also watching five platforms at the same time. I know. We I yeah, know. we all it, she's on hold on one second. There she is. Do you do you need to put your live stream chat on slow mode? <laughs> yes. No, no, I, no. It was after I that. Can't she do asked that, the Mackay. question. No, she asked the question lower. Uh you said you, in the chat it's so now, did you, my it, last comment. The question is please do you have the decent answer to your question? No, well, here it is. He previously said he would Google about Michael Obernicia. What? Hope he has a well, wait, other wait, 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 spell. I'll do it right now. Michael O. B E R N I C I A. Hope he is, as otherwise he's continuously doing incorrect videos and needs to learn about the dangers of the jab. Of what? Dangers of the jabs. Okay. Was that the question? No, no, listen. Wait, that I, wasn't I am, the question. I am not going to learn about the danger. I'm going to learn about the dangers of any medical intervention. From the medical from society. Peer reviewed <laughs> medical publication in highest quality journals. Period. I think that was her everything question. else I will keep an eye on, but I will then start to look for confirmation in the science. Otherwise, no. Yeah. No, no, no. But thank mm -hmm. you for offering that information. Mm -hmm. I mean, I listen, everybody has a choice. We're all worried about everything and now we're worried about war. So I, I guess, <laughs> you know, we'll still keep keep talking about COVID because it well, is Well, speaking important. of war, we're going to have a Brigadier General in here on Thursday, and we will get into that with him. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, a little different kinds of topics, but on Thursday we'll go into the Ukrainian war in quite a bit of detail because I, I, there's a lot of people talking about military things. Yeah, Dr. Roger Nelson is tomorrow. That's not him. No, it's guy. Tony Tata, Anthony Tata. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to love that name. <laughs> I know. Uh, he has a... You just made everybody giggle a little well, bit. Well, he wrote a book that I started reading. It's extraordinary. He wrote a whole bunch of books. I was also a history major, and I was thinking about being a lawyer or a therapist, so those were my two choices, so this is right up my alley. Uh, Dr. Dr. Nelson is director of the Global Consciousness Project, so this is kind of interesting. Well, Susan will love this. Works in integrative sciences and spirituality. Woo. I'm talking about global. Woo. Now, now <laughs> this is <laughs> this is the stuff that um, guys like Massimo. Um, Ju I can't remember his last name. Uh, they go around debunking stuff like this, but uh, I was like listening to what they've got to say. So tomorrow we're going to do that. This so Susan will be very into this. And Susan, you should do some of the interview with me. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mew Mew said that she liked the bathroom items situation on after dark <laughs> yes i know he did a better job on this trip though i have to say he was he didn't put everything by the light socket and he also brought less stuff brought the same amount of stuff exact same stuff as always i just pushed it into the corner and then i put my toothbrush out by the coffee machine yeah and thank plugged god it in there i hate that thing so Su susan cannot stand that I plug anything in because she has a, a, a roller and a dryer <laughs> and a, I don't know what else that gets plugged in. So anybody else using a plug is a deep and profound threat. We to need her. a two bedroom suite so, next time. So No, 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 no. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> We're fine. 
Uh, it's going to cost you, honey, it, Tom, to keep complaining. Tom Giannette says that's for the mommy show. Yes, that's for mommies. <laughs> for you, those of you that like to keep your jeans high Yeah, and head tight. on over to YouTube and check it out. Um, it's the latest episode of uh, Dr. Drew After Dark. Yeah, check that out, please. I think you'll like it. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow with Dr. Nelson, Thursday with uh, General, Brigadier General, Tat General Tata. And we're going to bring have a power strip. Thank you, Jodo. That's a good idea. Uh, that is an interesting idea. <laughs> <laughs> that we'll probably fight over that too though <laughs> jeremy murphy on wednesday and a lot of good stuff coming down the line we, we and he really always goes on. right by the magnifying mirror i well, don't that's know that's weird because that's plugged in also right to electrical and so that's why it's there by the plug yeah sometimes so, yeah yeah that's true so i i'm i look i need the, that more than you i have to put on eye makeup here, there's something to be learned from this conversation uh i aim to please there's no reason i don't need my stuff plugged in any special place if it's really important to her it's better that we I know, but like do did that. I tried to say it in a nice way to you. I tried to go, you know, could you do me a favor and like maybe put your stuff not in front of the electrical socket so I can get to it. It just takes me a long time. And then you were like kind of defensive, but you Well, because that was upset. after that was after three years of you just unplugging my toothbrush. <laughs> and and and, and not... then also making you use the bathroom on the other side of the <laughs> building. <laughs> right. Which I happily do because hey, the listen, relationship I don't want and you your to happiness, die alone, but I want you to appreciate when I'm there. The relationship and your <laughs> happiness is more important to me than anything else. You so. want me to come? You can get on the road by yourself if you want. No, I don't want to. So, so, tell them what you said. I don't want you to die alone. All right, nobody after deserves Bob to die died, alone like, in I'm, a hotel I'm traveling room. with you from now on. Yeah, That's nobody it. deserves Good. that. We're at a point in our life when we should be doing that. We should be just doing, doing stuff. I mean, I that. might deserve it, but you don't. All right, I'm done, everybody. Thank you. We've got way over today. Thank you, Caleb. I know you got to get back to your baby, and uh, we drone on here. I got to uh, go make you some steaks. Right on, and we will see you all tomorrow. A beet salad. Oh, awesome! I'm ready. I know. Tomorrow at three o'clock. See you there. Before. But what do you want done to your armpits? <laughs> no, I, your armpits me. are very erogenous. I understand. Like, what what should be done to them? I don't know. Is it no, mouth, tongue? I guess I don't know. We are so sensitive. Tom, okay. All right. Thanks. I don't know. Any help me out here. Uh, dude, you want to? <laughs> you want to help? <laughs> you, want, you want to jump in the middle of this? Go ahead. <laughs> Come over here and show him. Oh my God. <laughs>Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com/help.